Family Matters series, uh, when Pastor Keenan first said, you know, this is how we're starting the new year, um, focusing on family, and we've had some activities that we've gone home with every week, and, you know, things to build culture within our family uh, dynamic, to be in the word, to be um, in prayer together, to worship together. And if I'm honest, at first I was like, God, it feels like we did this before. Like we did this already. Um, are you just having us kind of go through a refresher? You know, maybe we haven't been spending as much time as family like we need to. So this must just be you reminding us and, and refreshing us to keep first things first. But as Pastor Keenan, um, over the first two weeks, began to, to preach on this topic of family matters, um, I knew that there was nothing about this series that was like previous ones, that God was actually calling us to um, a greater maturity in our understanding of family and, and what that dynamic looks like. And uh, one of the key threads throughout this series has been family matters in the context of it's important but then there are also some family matters, as in there's some issues, there's some things that need to be figured out. And the reality is, is most of us kind of live in one or of the extremes, that most of us have grown accustomed to living in one of those truths or the other. We're either loyal to our family no matter what. Family matters. I'm loyal, blood is thicker than water, it doesn't matter what they do, it doesn't matter what things look like, that's my family, family matters. And there's truth to that. And on the other side of that, there's some of us who live in the reality of like, it's too much stuff going on, all those family matters, all those dynamics, look, as for me and my house, we gonna serve the Lord and I'll see y'all when I see ya. Because it's, it's just too much. The family matters are way too much to immerse ourselves in. The baggage, the trauma, the pain. And so like I said, it, it's easy for us to kind of swing the pendulum from one side to the other and say either I'm loyal to my family no matter what or you know what, the family matters, it's just too much. I need to have some distance and, and separate myself. And the reality is, is both of these statements are true. And I believe that God is saying to the gathering church today, in, co in, uh, in order to accomplish what I desire to do in this hour, I need you to mature and hold both of these truths at the same time. This isn't a new concept when God requires us to hold two realities that sometimes may even feel like they are in direct conflict or contradiction to one another, that he says, I need you to hold them at the same time. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we know those folks who are, they're just so moved by the spirit, and they ebb and flow with any spirit and you start saying hey hey that that spirit that you're entertaining contradicts the word of god and i know i'm a free spirit and then you have folks that are so to the word and it's all about the knowledge it's all about the law it's all about the word and you're and we know that the letter kills apart from the spirit so it's like that is not the yeah you may quote those scriptures but that is not the spirit that they are set in. And so this idea of God requiring his people, his body to hold two truths at the same time is not new. But it does require maturity. I need my people to mature and worship me, hear me, know me fully both in spirit and in truth. And I believe that God is emphasizing this in this hour because of the wickedness and the deception that is in our world. The Bible warns us in Matthew 24 that there will be a time that comes that even those chosen by God will be deceived. Matthew 24, 23 says, Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, 
or there he is. Do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will appear, and they will provide great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect, even God's chosen ones. Listen carefully. I have told you this in advance. So God is equipping us. He is preparing us, not just for now, but for the generations to come. That we must worship him, that we must know him, that we can no longer afford to just say, I'm going to be led by the spirit. And we can no longer afford to just say, I'm going to just memorize this word. That we must worship him, that we must have the maturity to follow him and to know him in spirit and in truth. I hear the Lord saying, I'm dealing with families in this season because I desire to restore all. And when we hear statements like this, we're talking about family. And, we, and when, we, when we say God is saying he wants to restore all, I think naturally most of us immediately go to this picture in our mind of one big happy family. We go to this season where everything seems to be perfect and everything is working in our favor and it's all making sense. And we say God is restoring all. And the, the picture of restoration is designed or imagined by our will. But when God declares restoration, it's not restoration through the lens of our desires and wishes. It's restoring and positioning for the promise and the covenant to be kept. It's a restoring and a positioning for the promise of Jesus' return. God is preparing his bride for the return of the king. Jesus is coming back. So God isn't restoring all in this hour to give you your fairy tale ending. We are preparing for war. We are in the last days. And it is time for the body of Christ to grab every soul that we are supposed to before the return of our king. So we serve a covenant keeping God not a genie that comes to fix everything in our lives that we desire to be the storybook. And when, and when God says he's a covenant-keeping God, keeping doesn't simply mean that he's going to maintain his side of the promise. Keeping, as in he's sovereign in what he declares is so, that it will be accomplished, and nothing can get in the way of that. He has no rival. He has no equal. So what we're dealing with right now is, is not a matter of if God's will is going to be done. We're dealing with where we're going to fall in the picture of his story. I believe what is significantly different about this series is we're not just creating in the natural, these traditions that make us good Christians. We're not just saying we want to make sure we're in the word and we're praying and we're worshiping as families just because we want to be good. This time around, we are going deeper and we are equipping ourselves and our children to be agents to accomplish the will of our Father, to be used as ambassadors in the earth, to breach every road that has gone off course. The restoration is not just happening in families. It's happening in businesses. It's happening in communities, in our careers. Each of us are on specific assignments. And God is ready to use us in a way that we've never been used before. When you've been marked by God, and you are a part of him repositioning things back into alignment with his will and his ways. There are things that will make or break your experience in this process. As I said, we're not here to determine what happens. It's done. Jesus is victorious. The battle is won. You're walking out your story. 
your experience and where you are going to fall. Every decision that we make will determine your life. Your decision making depends on where you will land in God's story. While eternity is secure in Jesus, I don't have a heaven or hell to put any of us in. I'm not here to debate that with you. However, I believe God has me here to tell you today that your decision making in this hour will determine if your life is full of famine or blessing. We are tr in a transition moment as the body of Christ. And I believe we are faced with two questions. The first is, will you mature? Will you commit to maturing? Will you commit to holding two truths at once and then depending on the spirit of the living God to guide you and direct you in how you are supposed to engage with what he's showing you? Will you mature? The second question is, will you respond with repentance and humility, or will you seek blessings outside of God's plan? As God reveals himself to you, as God corrects you, as God illuminates areas in your life that have gone off course, will you respond with repentance and humility, or will you just go and seek blessing outside of God's will? We're going to spend some time today in one of my favorite books of the Bible. And it's my favorite for many reasons, but it also has great history to um, just our church community. And it's the book of Ruth. Pastor Keenan's first sermon on this stage in July of 2021 was from the book of Ruth. And it was groomed to glean. And I highly recommend going back and listening to the sermon. It's also the book that... Um, once I realized that God was not just calling us to a monthly gathering, um, that ministry, a ministry was being born, I ran to Mama V and I said, I want you to teach me the word as if I know nothing. And she said, well, let's start in the book of Ruth. And we spent two months. We wake up at 6 and usually from like 6 to 7.30-ish. We were walking through the book of Ruth, understanding kinsmen, redeemers, and just the whole beautiful story. And, and that was two months that we did that. And then the Lord said, now I want you to teach this same book. And we spent another four to six months in our women's Bible study, walking through the book of Ruth. And so it has grown on me, and it just has so much depth. Um, just in our story as a church and, and personally. And I told Pastor Keenan when I felt the Lord taking me to the book of Ruth, um, and I'm like, okay, yes, I, I know where you're going with this. I was super excited. I got even more excited that as I began to prepare this sermon that it took me right, and I didn't realize this, but it was taking me right back into our key verses for this series. And I'm like, God, like I'm not smart enough I'm not smart enough to work my way from the end back to the beginning, and the beginning lines up with our key verses for this series. Thank you for just being God. I love when he shows himself in that way. And often the book of Ruth has been used completely out of context to tell women the kind of man that they should be looking for, which is horrible context for the story because that's not at all what we're looking for. But it is a beautiful story of Jesus and his bloodline and the preparation of that bloodline. And so as I stated earlier, we are in a transition moment as the body of Christ. And transition moments are a big responsibility because you're connecting the past and the future. And when we do this, when we know that we are chosen by God to be a part of bridging these, these gaps or bridging these breaches in our family's history or in our communities or in the body. It's great responsibility. And if we are not clear on the instruction from the Lord, we will find ourselves experiencing death and famine, 
or blessing in life. So our key verse for this series has been Joshua's final words to the children of Israel. At the end of the book, Joshua speaks before all of Israel, and he's warning them that I'm not going to be with you always. You're doing great right now. You're worshiping the one true and living God right now, but I'm not going to be with you always to keep you on the right path. And the children of Israel, they're in the promised land. They've made it to this point, but they have so much ahead of them. And Joshua renews the covenant at Shechem in Joshua 24, where God is saying through Joshua, he's reminding them, I gave you this land. I brought you to this place. I fought the battles. You are only in this place because of who I am, not because of what you've done. And he's reminding them of this. And, and then Joshua is, is telling them, remember, I'm not going to be with you always to, to make the decisions for you. You have to know for yourselves. And so we're going to pick up here, and it's uh, Joshua 24, verse 12. And it says, I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, the two Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you the land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build and you live in them and you eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and, and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and perform those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, Joshua said, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them to create he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under an oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. And there are two things that stuck out to me in this text that I've never seen before. The emphasis that Joshua was making on our ancestors. Because we have to remember the children of Israel, they are in the promised land and they are getting ready to go into their inheritance and the text says in verse 15 but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve 
whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites whose land you are living in. Joshua is warning them that there's some stuff on your bloodline that you're not actively bowing to right now. But there's some stuff that can come up in the future. And there's also some gods in this land that you've never seen before that you're unfamiliar with. And I need you to know, I need you to recognize when these foreign gods erect themselves because if you bow to them, you will contradict the covenant that we just made. Some of us right now, we're in seasons where old gods that are on our bloodlines are manifesting themselves right in front of us. And some of us are looking at new gods, that, and we're in new territory that we've never seen these gods before. And in this hour, you better be able to discern the difference. You need to know if this is a new God in this new land or if this is an old God that is just trying to resurrect itself. There's stuff that's rising up in this hour. There's stuff that's rising up in you because you've never been in this place before. And what will happen is we'll think we're so pure. Oh, no, I've been walking with the Lord for so long. Oh, my devotion to God, I am, I am just yielded to him in a way, oh, no, I will only serve the one true and living God. And all God has to do is place you in an unfamiliar place. And there is stuff that will start manifesting in your heart and in your personality. There will be temptations that you said, I would never be tempted by that. That's not even my personality to act like that. And all God has to do is place you in an unfamiliar place. And you'll bow. The second thing I noticed in the text is Joshua's reality of having to accept what they were saying with their mouth, but by the spirit knew they were lying. And you may say, Pastor Z, where, where did it say they was lying? Joshua tells them, choose ye this day who you will serve. And then we look at their response says the Lord replied I'm sorry the people replied we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods for the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt he performed mighty miracles before our very eyes as we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies he preserved us it was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord for he alone is our God. This is what they said to Joshua. They pulled on their history. No, my God, we know our God. There's no way we would bow to any. Absolutely not, Joshua. And let's look at how Joshua responded. He says, then Joshua warned the people you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will, not he will turn against you and destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. This is not a natural response to someone you believe. This is not a natural response to someone you believe. This is a response you give when you know that someone is saying what they're supposed to, but they are a liar. And you're called to warn them. You are trying to warn them that just because they say it with their mouths, it does not matter what we say with our mouths if the spirit on the inside of us is not in alignment with what our words are saying. And the discord that goes back and forth between Joshua and the children of Israel, he never arrives at a place of believing them. 
He just says, this is a, we are a witness to what we've declared. And he continues to warn. He was not convinced. And some of you are so confused when you engage with each other, when you engage with people and you say all the right things. But why, why, does it, why does it still feel like we're not on the same page? Because someone's lying. This came up in our women's meeting two weeks ago. Until you are brutally honest with yourself and those around you, you are the only one being deceived. That, that's the tricky thing about pride. It's the tricky thing about deception is you're the only one who doesn't know. You're the only one who doesn't realize what's happening. God does not usurp our free will. So we have to choose to humble ourselves before the Lord. There are conversations that all of us are having within our families, at our jobs, within relationships. You can get a text message and an email that says you are wonderful and the most amazing person in the world, but your spirit says, I hate you and I can't stand you. The unseen is always more real than what is seen. I don't care what you say with your mouth. If the spirit of the living God doesn't testify to it, you're a liar. Just because you say it, just because you act like it, does not make it truth. We'll see in the text and we'll see it in our lives that the, the discerner, the tiebreaker of of who was telling the truth is time. Time always reveals. Time is a gift. All it takes is time. We get caught up in being right. We get caught up in fighting battles in our own strength. We, we want to over explain. We want to be understood. And when you rest in God, you get to a place where you say, time, time is on my side. He fights my battles. All I have to do is wait on the Lord. So after this exchange, Joshua dies. And the children of Israel and their, the various tribes, they go into the, their inheritance and the, the instruction the only instruction to the children of Israel was to drive out the inhabitants in the land. And so you go from the end of Joshua where he dies, and now you're in the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, you see the consequences of disobedience. You see that each tribe went about it in their own way. Some said, we're going to marry, and, and you know, some, we're going to make them slaves, and they can work for us. Some of us, we'll kill half of them, but we, we got tired, and they fine. They not, we're not even using that land over there, so they're fine. And you see each tribe do what was right in their own eyes. And the book of Judges, you're just going through the cycle of disobedience throughout the generations. The book of Judges covers anywhere from four to 500 years of history of the children of Israel. And you see this cycle where they're serving the Lord and they're doing right and they're only serving God. And then they fall into sin and idolatry. And then Israel is enslaved. And then they cry out to the Lord, deliver us, help us, God, help us, God. And then God raises up a judge. He raises up a perfect judge to walk them out, to bring them into deliverance. And then they're, they're serving God again, and they're worshiping the one true living God. And then the cycle just repeats itself. In each chapter, for hundreds of years, we see this cycle repeat over generation after generation after generation. And each time, God is faithful, and he raises up a judge. He raises up a deliverer, and he is faithful to his people, even though we are unfaithful to him. And the book of Judges never gets better. 
It literally gets worse as you read through the book of Judges. It gets more violent. It gets more gory. It's no happy ending. And then the next book is the book of Ruth. And it's almost as if God is saying, look at the millions of people. Look at the children of Israel. Everyone is doing right in their own eyes. In Judges, you see these two versions of, of these scriptures over and over. The first one is Judges 17 and 6. And it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And you see the other scripture, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served other gods. We need to understand that there is a way that seems right to man, but it is evil in the sight of the Lord. We cannot depend on our own wisdom. We cannot depend on our own understanding because there is a way that seems right to us, but it is evil in the sight of the Lord. And so we see this big picture of chaos. And then God says, let's zoom in to one family. As we go into the book of Ruth, we zoom into one family. And the book of Ruth doesn't begin with Ruth. It begins with Elimelech. And the scripture says, we're in Ruth 1. It says, in the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Euphrates, for, I'm sorry, uh, Ephratites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, the other a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her, and her husband. So many of us would just kind of rush past this because we're like, this is the book of Ruth. Like, let me get to Ruth. Like, this seems really irrelevant. But I need us to pause here and really process what's going on because in the same way that we're watching the children of Israel in this transition moment, we are in the same transition moment in our lives. And transitions, how we act, how we move, the decisions we make in seasons of transitions equal famine or blessing. So we have to remember the children of Israel, they were in the promised land. And God said that the promised land would be a land flowing with milk and honey. This was the place that God told them to go. This was the place that God brought them to. So famine in the land was not consistent with what God declared. Famine was a reflection. This wasn't, when we hear famine, I think we, it's so easy to go to our natural understanding of like, okay, well there, you know, there was, it was a bad time. You know, weather was bad. It just, there wasn't resources. No, no, no. Famine in the land was consistent with disobedience. Famine wasn't a reflection of just a bad season or a natural coincidence. If God declared that this was the promised land and they weren't having a promised land experience, it was a result of disobedience. So Elimelech's family goes from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And we may say, well, if there was a family, it's, it, it seems like Elimelech was wise to move to a place with resources. He's, he's the, the leader of his home. Why would he just have his family stick it out when there's famine in the land? This, this, must, this is a wise decision. Not only was his family in the promised land, but even within the promised land, they were in Bethlehem, the land of Judah. You are in the chosen place within the chosen place. And names are so important in scripture. 
Elimelech's name meant my God is king. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Judah means praise. And Moab, which is the land, the place that Elimelech chose to move his family to, Moab meant an idolatrous nation. So we need to, we need to read what's happening in the spirit. So the man whose God was king, who was from the house of bread, that lived in the land of praise, was experiencing a famine. So he chose to move his family to an idolatrous nation. What sense does that make? My name declares that my God is king. And I'm going to move from his chosen place. That is the house of bread. During a famine, I'm in the house of bread. In the land of praise. And I'm going to move from that place to an idolatrous nation. We need to understand that while Israel was physically in the promised land, they weren't having the promised land experience. Why? Because of disobedience. So what does this tell us? That you can be in the right place and never have the right experience because of your disobedience. I believe many of us are in a place in our life where we know this is where God has called me to. That this is where God brought me. I know this is the land. I know this is the season. I know this is the place. I know this is the time. But I am not having the promised land experience and we're frustrated. And I hear the Lord saying, don't mistake the land that I have you in. Because it do doesn't look like what I've declared it to be yet. Do not dis mistake the land that I have you in because it does not look like what I've declared it to be yet. Elimelech looked at the famine and he said, I'm not in the right place. When he should have been remembering the God that he served, when he should have been remembering that my God is king, when he should have been remembering that I'm in the house of bread, that I'm in the land of praise. And this is many of our of our problem today, we look at our lives, we look at the state of our families, we look at our lives and we say, my family isn't this and my family isn't that and the job isn't working out like this and the job isn't working out like that. My relationships aren't doing what I want them to do. Nothing is working. My life doesn't look like this God that I serve. And God is saying, I need you to stop looking in the natural. And I need you to start standing on Romans 4 and 17 that says we've been given the power to declare those things that are not as though they are. That we declare the will of God. We need to stop regurgitating the current state of things and we need to get on our face and start asking God why God why is my family like this God why are my relationships like this God why is my city like this God why is my community like that because it's inconsistent with what you said because your word says that you have a plan to prosper me the word says that you do not desire to harm me. The word says that you died so that I could have an abundant life. So why am I not experiencing the fullness that you've declared? Why don't I experience? Why does the presence of God come into this place week after week and I go back into my life and it looks exactly the same? Why am I not experiencing joy? Why am I not free? Why am I not full of joy? Why am I not full of peace? We need to start asking God why. Search me, oh God, and show me what I am missing because my experience is inconsistent with who you say you are. But most of us begin to do exactly what Elimelech did. We look at our situation and we say, this must not be the place. And when we are faced with the judgment of our decisions, we have two options. 
We can choose repentance and, and choose to walk through the season trusting in our God. Or we can choose fear that leads us further into sin and bondage. Elimelech chose fear. And he moved his family into a land that he thought had more to offer. And as we read what happened in Moab, it says, Then Elimelech died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah and the other woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Malon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. And while we are reading about a physical move, a physical place that happens in, in the word, we need to understand that today Moab is a place in our heart. Moab isn't a physical place today. Moab is a place in our hearts that we can travel to. We need to be aware that our hearts will deceive us. And so many of us live by, just trust my heart. Trust my heart. I'm going to follow my heart. I'm going to follow my heart. And, Bible, and the Bible says in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. And who can understand it? So I don't trust my heart. I don't, I don't trust my heart. I trust the word of God. I trust the spirit of God. And so many of us are sick today because we are letting our heart's desires lead our lives and not God. We are mentally sick. We're emotionally sick. We're physically sick. And we've been sick for years because we've made idols of our hearts. My heart desires this. I know, I know it may seem like I'm contradicting the word of God, but God knows my heart. No, you're in sin. You're in rebellion. Your heart is wicked. And you've made an idol of it. And I need you to know that we are in a time where the king of glory is here. And he will not rival with your idols. When he comes in, every idol must bow. Every single one must be tore down. And what's so amazing, while we can feel the fire of God in the text, at the same exact time, we see his patience for those that he loves. Because in the great, we see the grace in this story as well. Because he doesn't allow the consequences to come just because they went to Moab. The text says, then Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married. They settled there. It was when they chose to settle in that place that the consequences came. It wasn't because they went just went there. And we need to understand that, that when stuff begins to rise up in us, God is not condemning us because we're human, because we have real emotions, we have real biases, we have real pain, we have real trauma, we have real stuff on our bloodline that we're fighting through. He does not condemn us because we arrive in Moab. There are consequences when we choose to stay there, when we choose to make a home there. When we choose to say, I'm going to intermix with the people here. I'm going to let their ways impact the way that I move. God is gracious. Ten years later is when they saw the consequences of the decision to go there. That made they had ten years to go back. God is patient. And Moab looks different for all of us. Remember, it says it was an idolatrous nation. You can make an idol out of anything. Anything that becomes more important than God is an idol. Your family can be an idol. Your spiritual gifts can become an idol. The way God chose to use you could become an idol. God things can become idols. 
Look at, look at beliefs that worship creation above the creator. It's making an idol out of what God has created. Anything can become an idol. So that lets us know that all of us can fall victim to this. The problem isn't arriving at the place. The problem is when we choose to settle there. Each of us have some places right now in our hearts where we've settled. And we think because we haven't experienced the consequences that somehow God's cool with it. Well, you know, I've been I've been living like this for a minute. And God's still been blessing. So he must be good with it. I mean, I know it's sin, but I always, I mean, I've really kind of always had this heart posture and God's been blessing me. God's been keeping me. So, I mean, I know that's what you say, but I must be good. And I have to imagine that Elimelech and his family, they, they stayed for 10 years because it seemed like things was working out. And that's where we get caught up when the word of God is not the plumb line. When the word of God is not the measure of for success, you will be in a place living in blatant sin, thinking that you are in blessing. The word of God is our plumb line, not our ideas and our concept and what seems to be working out on our behalf. Elimelech's decision cost him everything. He died. His sons died. And his wife was left alone. And if you read through the book of Ruth, the journey back to Bethlehem was not easy. It was dangerous. It was two women traveling alone back to the place. And we need to understand that, that in God, you just retake the test. We think, okay, I'm going to bypass obedience and I'm going to go to this new place and I'm not going to ever have to deal with the disobedience. No, you're going to take that road right back until you pass the test of obedience. There's no shortcuts in this. And when our children... are looking at us. You may not even make it out. It may be your children that got to travel this road back. You may die in the wrong place. And now your children have to take the walk back to Bethlehem. Because and that's, that's the whole point of this series is that God's will will be done. I know that we think we have so much weight I know that we think we're so wise. I know that we think we're so powerful and we can move however we want, but you will bow. The Bible says every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. You will bow. So you choose to bow today or you're going to choose to bow 10 years. And I know when I meet my king, when I meet God, I want to say that I just bowed. That I didn't spend my life having to go in circles, having to keep going through the same assignment over and over and over again because of disobedience. I want to live a life that says I will bow again. I will say yes again. I will say yes again. God, tear it all down. Okay, we're going to rebuild. I don't care how long it takes, but I don't want to keep going around the same reality for my entire life. And then meet God and, and say, I only accomplished level A. Because I spent 50 years running from obedience. I spent 50 years trusting in my own knowledge and understanding. Like I said, I don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. But when you meet him, what will you say? What will you return to him? What crown will you lay at his feet? 
Who wants to come to the party empty-handed? Who wants to come to the party unprepared? And so many of us live our lives as if the only thing that matters is getting to heaven. No, I want to get to heaven and have plenty to lay at his feet. Where have you settled? What Moab is existing in your heart? And I believe that God is challenging us today and through this series to look back at our family history and to ask God, how did we get here? Why is my bloodline riddled with divorce? Why is my bloodline riddled with mental illness? Why are we riddled with poverty? Why are, why are we riddled with pain, with trauma, with secrets, with molestation, with alcoholism? Why are we riddled with these things? And some of you are fighting battles that don't even belong to you. But you're completely unaware of the covenants, of the altars that have been erected on your bloodline. And I'm sorry, but your perfect Christian behavior doesn't tear down bloodline covenants. I'm sorry, but your five-minute devotional does not tear down the kingdom of darkness. I'm sorry, your tithing does not tear down the spirit of poverty. And so you can live your life saying, no, there's no curses. There, we're in the new covenant. Jesus is one at all. Go right ahead and get to heaven empty-handed because there is a ruler of this world. There are principalities. There are spirits. There are demons. The kingdom of darkness is the ruler of this world. And if you think that you have the power in your own strength to combat the king of this world, the prince and the ruler of this world, and be victorious while claiming Jesus, you're insane. We only win by the blood. We only win by the word. We only win by the spirit. If you don't know how to work the blood, if you don't know how to decree and declare the blood of Jesus, if you don't know how to declare the word, you will live life in hell because you will not be victorious. You will not have freedom. And you will come to this place Sunday after Sunday and not experience freedom. You will get free and you'll go right back into that house of chaos. You'll get free and go right back into that job and never get the paycheck that you desire. Because there is a kingdom. There are principalities working against you. And you cannot fight it in your own strength. You have no power in your own strength. So you better get you a few scriptures to decree and declare. You better understand how to plead the blood of Jesus. You better understand how to worship in spite of what you feel like. What idols have erected in you? And you may say, I've, been, I've dealt with the bloodline stuff. I, I get it. I know it. I, I got it. There are some of us walking into our promised land season. And there are unfamiliar idols. You get in your promised land. God begins to prosper you. God begins to give you titles. He begins to give you resources. And you're completely unaware of how, how having a little money make you feel. You're completely unaware of, it's some peace in my home. I don't, I don't have to go to church as much as I used to. We good. I got a little breathing room. I'm good. You better be able to discern the new idols. Or you'll be in the promised land. 
and still having an Egypt experience. You'll be in the place and never taste the milk and honey. You'll be in the place and never experience the freedom. You'll watch everyone else get free. You'll watch everyone else get healed. God is coming after the idols. And we will only be able to navigate this transition in our lives if we commit to the maturity where we can hold two truths at the same time. Where we can say, yes, my family matters. Yes, I want my family to be a part of what God is doing and I want to include them. But, man, there's some family matters, and I, I just can't get with that stuff. I'm not bringing that into my house. I have fought too hard to get that stuff up off of us. I can't go back. And we need to remember that we are not here to accomplish a fairy tale ending. I am guilty. It was a few years ago that God told me, Z, I love you so much. But this is not a fairy tale. This is not a fairy tale. It's not going to be one big happy family and, and all of your loved ones are, are going to receive me and, and come to church and it's going to be one big party. The party doesn't happen here. The fairy tale doesn't happen here. And some of us in our hearts, we need to deal with that. That God is not a genie. He doesn't have the magic wand wrapping it all up perfectly with a bow. Mark 3 and 33 says, he answered them, who is my true mother and my true brothers? Then looking in the eyes of those who were sitting in a circle around him, he said, here are my true family members. For whoever does the will of God is my brother my sister and my mother. This family matters in this room. I don't care what the birth certificate says. Are you doing the will of my father? You have to grow up. And realize this isn't a fairy tale. There's casualties in war. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's where we're at. My mom hemmed me up at 13 and said, as long as you live under this roof, we will serve the Lord. And I thought she was crazy. And I said, I'm leaving. And I left. And I got a taste of the world. And I came right back. And I thank God it didn't take 10 years. I thank God it didn't take me getting addicted to drugs. I thank God it didn't take me getting pregnant. I thank God it didn't take me getting caught up in a lifestyle that I couldn't ever come up out of. See, that's the thing that we have to understand, that you could leave, but you don't know how long it's going to take you to get back. You don't know the road that you're going to travel to get back to the house of bread in the land of praise. So as for me and my house, you're going to find us at Carco Theater. As for me and my house, you're going to find us praising the Lord. As for me and my house, we will do it God's way. As for me and my house, whatever the Lord says is what we do. Because I don't know how long I have. We got to grow up. God is saying, will you mature? Will you recognize the family that I have placed you in? And your family is the people who are doing the will of your father.
in this time, I want to open up the altar. If you've identified any idols, Moab, if you can say I've gone to Moab, you have two options right now. You can repent. That's all he asks for is us to repent in humility. That's it. Or you can say, you know what? I I don't think that that's that big of a deal. And I'm just going to keep keep doing what I'm doing. And you'll seek blessing in the idolatrous nation. And God is patient. He is kind. And I don't have a, it's not a message of fear. It's not, it's not even that. It's not to scare you into repentance at all. Because I don't, I don't know what time you have. So you may be good. That's up to you. But it's playing Russian roulette with your soul. And God is so gracious. All he asks for is repentance. All he says is just, I want you to turn to me. What kind of God says, I know that you've rejected me. I know you turned to doing it your own way. And all I'm asking you to do is to trust me. All I'm asking you to do is to come back. Because he's a loving father. He just wants you home. Will you mature? Will you respond with repentance and humility or will you seek blessing outside of God's plan? At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Tini. I thank you, God. I thank you for the word. God, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the word. I thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God, I pray right now that you would speak to your people in every area that we have been deceived, where we think you are okay with sin, where we think you are okay with idols. God, I pray that you would remove every blinder and that we would use this time to return home. In Jesus' name, amen.